Okay, so now everybody can download the presentation if uh, he want it's from the Zoom chat. Okay, so uh, it's 35 minutes now. I think we may uh, start. Uh, so good morning, evening, day, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start our next uh, seminar of our Quantum Technology Center of Moscow State University. And uh, today we have a talk from Nikola Stamaski, uh, a, from a co-founder of uh, Quandela company who uh, produce uh, single photon uh, sources based on quantum dots. Uh, so he will tell us about this stuff and how to use it. Yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you Up. very much for the introduction. First of all, do you see screen is all right yeah okay so well thanks a lot for proposing me to join your uh, set of seminar so i look forward to discuss with you as uh, reply to all your question if not later as i said even afterwards uh, by direct contact mail and, and so on so i'm going to present you uh what is Quandela, but in general uh, how can solid state single uh, photon source uh, help in scaling up uh, quantum technologies? Before doing that, a few words about Quandela, which is a kind of new uh, spin off company, uh, three years old next June, co founded by Valerian Gies, uh, Professor Pascal Senlar, and myself. Uh, now we are nine people and we have several open positions. Uh, we hope to find new motivated quantum optics enthusiasts uh, next this year. So please share uh, the advertisement if you know someone that can be happy to join both in quantum computing projects and device fabrication. So uh, Quandela uh, was created to exploit uh, solid state single photon source technology, which was developed by Professor Pascal Senelar in her group, uh, the Center on Science and Nanotechnology, which is part of the National Research uh, Center of France, uh, CNRS, over the past 20 years. So this is the building where the Institute uh, is uh, now located uh, with 410 people, mostly researchers. We are two startups which rents the space and clearly we are in this beautiful building to exploit the uh, 2,900 square meter fully equipped uh, clean room uh, together with the uh, equipment and the experience of the engineer to develop sources and uh, new devices that we're gonna produce more. So in this institute, most of the people work with 3.5 semiconductor for photonics and, uh, and microelectronics. And where it's located is in the south suburb of uh, Paris, uh, in the heart of the Paris Saclay uh, campus, uh, which is directly connected to Paris by train with a 40, 40 minutes drive, and is located in a very uh, moving environment with plenty of universities and um, companies, big companies, but also newly created startup also in the quantum technology uh, area. So of course we work with quantum technologies. Uh, we want to take part in this second quantum revolution that uh, all of you I'm sure you've heard of, uh, taking part also in the contributing with these beautiful images of uh, devices, uh, following the aim of uh, developing the holy grail in this new uh, set of technology, which is the quantum computer, which is really seen as a space uh, race of the century. This is uh, not my words, so I took it from, uh, from the press. And uh, you know, in the, you, you are part of the international uh, movement of uh, amazing scientists contributing both in the fundamental science and in development of devices, uh, also exploiting um, several uh, national investment and investment of uh, big companies to develop these technologies, which are really seen with very high economic and political also uh, potential. 
but this technology not only refer to quantum computing, you can find several market studies presenting the markets also of several other related uh, environments, especially quantum communication and quantum sensing and metrology with application uh, not only in communication uh, infrastructure, but also in medicine, in uh, army uh, and so on with a market which is increasing largely for quantum computing, but is already uh, very broad also for other technologies. So no matter where we look at in these technologies, what is clear is that uh, photonics and all the enabling technologies related to it uh, are at the center for, the, for boosting um, quantum technologies in general, and therefore uh, single photon sources. That's because photons is the only known way to transfer information, so to develop and put in place quantum communication protocol, but not only to communicate between a point and another to transfer information, but also to interconnect different quantum machine, uh, different quantum computers, no matter how the platform uh, will be chosen or will be the one that will, let's say, win this uh, space race, photon will be required to interconnect them and to create this so-called quantum internet. And we already have example of ion trap based uh, computing platform and optical quantum computing platform, which have been connected uh, through single photon and entangled photons. Another important point for developing quantum computing mostly is that photons have a long coherence time they can support high clock rates for high speed operation, also exploiting uh, telecom based technology, which is already working at uh, several gigahertz speed. Another important fact is that photon can be manipulated at room temperature with no need of vacuum compared to other platform, for example, superconducting qubits and silicon based qubits, which require mainly Kelvin temperature or atoms-based uh, technology, Rydberg atoms, or ion traps, which require um, high vacuum. So photons uh, exploit uh, an amazing technology, which is optical fiber, which is intrinsically the wiring of all the components uh, that require to be uh, modularly assembled to create an optical uh, quantum computing platform. And another interesting point is that uh, we have with photonics uh, large protocol flexibility and we can exploit uh, cluster state of entangled photon for several um, several purposes. These are uh, very high potential uh, system that can be used both in communication uh, to develop measurement based uh, quantum repeater in uh, opposite to the memory based quantum repeater or also in, uh, in computing. So that's a brief outline of what I'm going to tell you about introducing uh, single photon source technologies in general, focusing on quantum computing, and then the technology exploited at Condela with some implementation, and of course, also discussing some of the future challenges that we are already facing. So without going into details, Optical quantum computing in general can be described as a sequence of linear optical elements which are used to manipulate a large number of photons, single photons. And it can be uh, seen schematically as a set of three, four different modules, uh, a part generating quantum light, a part manipulating the light, and a part detecting it with the classical control in order to use feedback to. Uh, uh, modify the gate. So if I use more fancy images, you can see here, uh, you can set your linear optical elements in integrated photonics by using silicon, silicon nitride, silica, or other uh, materials, which can be fabricated in uh, foundries all over the world. So we can squeeze linear optical element in few millimeters square in order to manipulate the light, which is coupled in with fibers from the first element, which is generating the single photon, 
and then uh, observe through the other end with other optical fibers to detect and analyze the, uh, the distribution of light uh, among different outputs and then to control these gates externally by a classical uh, control classical uh, switches and uh, a logic. So here among the three uh, important parts, uh, the circuit uh, can be fabricated, can be purchased uh, with very high quality, low loss, so you can make your design, get your chip uh, sent by uh, mail. You can buy detectors, which now reach even 90, 95% efficiency. And these are, uh, you can find several companies, startups um, created from a research group. And one is actually there in Moscow, the first and the most famous one. The problem then is in the light, in the generation of quantum light. And that's where Quandela is trying to help. In order to understand which are the characteristics of a single photon source, we have to take a step backwards and look at the figure of merits. In the ideal source, you want uh, a device which is emitting each time you press a button, uh, one single photon per pulse. So the figure of merit are the following, the brightness, which is giving you actually the probability of actually having a photon every time you press a button. So every time you uh, send, for example, an input laser on the device, then you want only to have one single photon per pulse and you want all the photons to be identical in any degree of freedom, because in this way, only this way they can uh, interact and they can be used to perform logic operation. And the way we study indistinguishability is by using on command interference, sending two photon in a beam splitter and looking at the output distribution. And only when they are fully indistinguishable, they either exit on one side or the exit on the other side. This element is the basic element in the um, current optical quantum computing uh, protocol. So if brightness gives you the speed of the computation, so it gives you an idea of how complex can be your calculation, because of course you need many photons to send to your circuit in order to compute something uh, important, the single photon purity and distinguishability gives you the fidelity of the logic gate. So you want uh, low error, so you don't want multi-photon emission and you want your level of distinguishability to be as maximum as uh, possible. But fabricating single photon source is not easy. The community so far uh, been working with uh, approximated laser sources based on laser. Uh, you can fat use uh, laser to uh, get single photons when you filter them uh, strongly or uh, you can generate indistinguishable entangled photon by means of nonlinear processing. For example, shining a laser on a crystal by a spontaneous parametric non-conversion, you can get two entangled indistinguishable photon coming out of the process as for uh, four wave mixing in a similar way. So here, the important thing to note is that the generation of this photon is probabilistic. You cannot decide when the single photon are generated and you cannot decide how many of photons you get in the, into the two modes when the process is activated. So what do you do? People usually is to herald uh, the presence of a photon with a detector in another path. And if you look, and the way to describe the system, we have this function depending on this factor lambda and the sum of uh, multi-component uh, photons. So when, the, uh, when we herald a photon and we take lambda close, uh, very small, then we can look at the uh, first two uh, component, first uh, single photo state of one and two photo state. And we see that the brightness of the device, the amount of photos you can get is proportional to this lambda as the uh, second order correlation function, which gives you the single photon purity. So how many multi-photon you will get. So you want this to be 
close to zero. So you want to be uh, this lambda as small as possible, but having this factor small, you will be obliged to also have a brightness. small, And that's the intrinsic limitation of uh, laser-based sources. These are real data where you can see the brightness of SPDC process with the multi-photo probability. And you see that in order to keep your multi-photon emission uh, low, so the low error, you are forced to work in a region where your source is only a few percent uh, bright. Nevertheless, there are several tricks that people have came up with, uh, very smart, very interesting, for example, multiplexing, which consists in using inefficient uh, sources, many of them, and repeat the operation many times and use classic logic to select the successful operation. So here you have schematic here, actually, how it's done. You have uh, a set of uh, SPDC sources, which are firing and each one has detector, each one has switches and delay. So you can pick up only the successful event and at the end have a, um, an output which is near deterministic. And this is used to uh, create a small cluster state, which are the base of uh, optical quantum computing in general. So here it, it's a system that probably will work but it's a system that requires a credible amount of resources and architecture complexity, and of course, cheap uh, space. So it, it's something interesting clearly considering that with uh, integrative photonics, you can uh, fabricate uh, linear components in few uh, micrometer square, as you can see in this top uh, image, or you see the blue lines, you see waveguides and coupler and the splitter. And with the uh, yellow line, you see the control, the electronics to control the phase of each uh, path of the splitter. So you can imagine to uh, have all this set of delays and sources and switches in a large wafer that you can mass produce in foundries and then analyze each one of them in order to characterize it in Thailand. So, very complicated process, but it's the one uh, choose, chosen by the startup Thai Quantum in order to develop their universal uh, quantum computer. Another way, though, is to use single emitters, to use efficient real single photon sources. Single, efficient, single emitter are natural atoms or artificial atoms. In either the case, they are presented by a two level system which uh, every time that is excited, it can emit only one photon and can do it deterministically with a probability equal to, to one. So here, the function representing the generative photons has different terms for vacuum, one uh, single photon, two single photon. You can see here the probability of generating each of them is independent, so you can uh, engineer a system in order to have probability of generating single Fox state equal to one and zero for the other 10. So at the same time, you can get brightness of one and uh, multi-photon emission equal to zero together with high indistinguishability. So the way we uh, have been doing this is to use semiconductor quantum dots, so-called artificial atom. These are uh, nanocrystal grown with three, five semiconductors, so gallium arsenide, aluminum arsenide, which are composed by thousands of uh, atoms. And due to the spatial confinement, their energy state are quantized, so they can really represent it by a two-level system. And in fact, we can uh, play with the laser uh, in order to excite the system and to uh, carefully, coherently control the two-level system and obtain the very clear Rabi oscillation, for example, as you can see here in the picture. Nevertheless, even if they are fabricated by big and scary machines, these are compatible with the three, five semiconductor industry. So they can potentially mass produce in a very uh, scalable uh, way. 
So there is no free lunch though. Uh, the problem is that when we keep these devices in the bulk, um, then the video is not working, sorry. then the probability of collecting a photon is very low because of the high reflective index of the material photons are trapped into the uh, semiconductor. So for this reason, uh, what the community have deployed is to use uh, photonic cavities. What we do in our case is to use a micropillar cavity, which is represented by uh, like waveguide uh, and consists in placing the quantum dot in between two mirrors, bottom and top mirror, to confine an optical mode and couple the quantum dot, the emitter, to this optical mode and to force the emitter to uh, couple the single photon and be uh, emitted only one direction in a very nice Gaussian mode so they can be uh, coupled with very high efficiency into a single mode fiber. So this is a, a structure design that's been exploited also by other groups around the world. And you can see here, for example, uh, a results of the group of Zhang Weipan and Chen Walu in China, uh, uh, proposing a scheme to develop optical quantum computing with single photon source. The idea here is to take the uh, maximum efficiency possible source and then rerouting the temporally separated photos different time being in different spatial mode, each one delayed in order to have all the photons coming at the same time, but in different uh, optical mode. And this is very impressive results uh, published in the last October in uh, PRL, uh, where they managed to, uh, to perform boson sampling experiment with 20 photon in a 60 uh, mode interferometer. So a part of performances, what is impressive here is that they did all this uh, incredible free space alignment in order to perform experiments where the 20 photons were uh, entering a 3D uh, cube with 60 mode input and the 60 mode outputs then were coupled to 60 single photon detector where you see here very carefully aligned. So another way to do this, what we would like to do and people would like to do is to uh, squeeze all that in integrated photonics. Here it makes more sense uh, for it, maybe now it's harder and will uh, not be so efficient, but it's clearly the way to do. So integrated photonics, which is such a scheme, it can be really uh, pushing optical quantum computing uh, far. So if we take a step back, uh, we can look at to the challenges in order to fabricate this micropillar based single sources, because we can have nice images quite easily, but in order to fabricate a natural device, it took many, many years uh, in the laboratory. That's because we have to face several challenges, which is the mode coupling, the out coupling of the photons outside the material and the coherence. Mode coupling because quantum dots grows randomly in the bulk and each one of them has a slightly different size from one another. So when you want an efficient source, you need to couple each quantum dot in the center of the micropillar and to match its size with the size of the micropillar. And this random, randomness clearly doesn't help. So as a way to do it, people were simply drilling micropillars with different sizes on over a large area and then scanning uh, all the micropillars and look for the most efficient one. That was not the way that uh, Pascal developed and wanted to work. So she fabricated a deterministic fabrication process consisting in a, confo in a confocal with three lines where we now can perform lithography at low temperature, which means we can select the quantum dot, study and characterize its emission and define its position very carefully and then draw the structure directly on top of the quantum dot. 
By doing this now, which is an artisan process, we can fabricate uh, 30 devices, for example, of a, a chip and have 10 or more with very uh, good performances. While in the other process, in the random fabrication, and this was stated in this paper, the statistics are not so nice in the sense that you need to look over 10,000 pillars in order to find one that actually works well. And clearly, you don't want to be the PhD student uh, doing this. So this technique was optimized and proposed in 2008 when we started to achieve very high quantum dot optical mode coupling. We worked then on the fabrication processes in order to reduce the lateral losses and to have very nice and clean structure uh, optimizing the, the fabrication process and achieve very high extraction efficiency, which both gave rise in this paper to actually the brightest single photon source ever reported so far, which is around 70, above 70% 70 brightness. Nevertheless, at that moment, there was still problem of coherence because this artificial atom uh, still lie in a, a solid state environment where spin and charge noise and photon can alter the, the phasing of, uh, of the artificial atom. And the way in order to overcome this was to introduce electrical contacts. By doing this, we could then get rid of all this charge noise and then achieve very high indistinguishability close to unity, about 99 point something percent in 2016. And another good point of having electrical contacts is that by applying an external bias, via Stark effect, we can tune the energy of the quantum dot and therefore to match the energy of the cavity mode and therefore achieve the highest brightness. As you can see in this video where we apply constantly a bias and we tune the energy of the meter until we achieve perfect resonance and therefore perfect uh, and maximum uh, emission. So now that's how the device uh, look like. We have a micro pillar in the center, the same structure now with four ridges which connect the micro pillar to a larger area where the electrical contact is placed. So you can see here from this, um, this wire. And we can fabricate several of them and very, have very nice fabrication. So the best performance at the moment we can get with this device, you can see here placed in the cryostat, uh, they can guarantee single photon purity above 97%, which reflects in a G2, so multi photon emission lower than 2%, and very high uh, indistinguishability and brightness. What is important here to note with the brightness is that if we look at the uh, one of the most bright uh, SPDC source that we found in the literature, an advantage of 20 times in terms of brightness for one photon produces a very strong, uh, more important advantage for higher number of photons as, uh, as the speed up increase exponentially with the number of photons. So you can see the importance of having uh, high brightness if we really want to increase the complexity of the computation. Another thing that we are working on, we were working this past year, a part of the uh, performance of the device is to make the uh, use much easier and more compact. So we have developed this confocal microscope, which sits on the top of the cryostat where the source is placed. We have uh, an input here for the laser that can be driven up to one gigahertz clock rate if you have fast enough detector. To detect it and then we can couple the single photon in a single mode fiber uh, with a probability higher than 70 percent which is very important in order to use efficiently these devices so these are the performance uh, we can achieve as i said previously and what is also important is that we can achieve very high stability of the uh, emission rate uh, over time over several days which is the basic requirements to do something more uh, complex. This is actually an open facility. So you people in the community can come and uh, play with devices and even bring their experiments, perform their experiment 
uh, by exploiting uh, the performances of the sources. So that's what's about next session. Uh, I will present a couple of works uh, coming out of this uh, collaboration where uh, different groups, different people were bringing their experiments in our lab here in Paris. First, with uh, the group of uh, Pascal Sinelar and Professor Roberto Zelame and Professor Fabio Charino from Milan and Rome. Uh, what we did uh, 2018, 2018 was to interfere and strip photons emitted from the single photon source in a photonic circuit uh, written on uh, silica. So that's again the, the modular system that I was telling you before about. We have a single photon source active, the multiplexing to reroute three photons in the input of the circuits, and then the detection path with. Uh, some tomography, some APD detectors. And the output distribution will look like this. If you have classical light, if you have a single photon and highly indistinguishable photon at the maximum level, you have, have this kind of distribution. And what we had, um, taking into account losses and imperfection of the single photon distinguishability, we could simulate this violet distribution, which was very nicely reproduced by the results as you can see here with the yellow bars. Uh, another important thing is that we could speed up this uh, process by 88 times compared to the previous experiment done with the same circuit with SPDC sources. So you see uh, here the uh, advantage of uh, the technology. Clearly there were some problems uh, that could actually be fixed most uh, especially the chip transmission and the coupling uh, of the photon in the chip, which is still one problem of integrative photonics. Here we use very inefficient detectors, APDs that at 920 nanometer wavelength, they have an efficiency of 25, 30%. And of course, another thing that needs to be improved is the brightness of the source, because just by increasing few percentages, you can really push up the number uh, of computing photon uh, uh, very fast. So this brings me to the challenges actually that we are trying to face, which are uh, first of all about the performance of the device. If we want to increase the brightness, we need to increase the brightness to make the source uh, more useful. We need to increase the indistinguishability as error in indistinguishability actually lower the number of if, uh, actually computed photon. And we uh, have already started to work on the possible modification of the device in order to emit directly entangled photon in a deterministic way. So clearly these three goals have a different time scale. Uh, we are already working on the brightness and we are optimizing a protocol uh, which can uh, almost double the current performances with the same devices. We now need to modify the devices and we are preparing a paper uh, that I hope to uh, share with you soon in the next month, maximum two, and then uh, improving the distinguishability and then over the next couple of years, probably have the first uh, demonstration of entanglement uh, generation directly from the source. Another important point, which we are following on the parallel side, is the usability. We are working and we want to uh, deliver a product which will be standalone and plug and play in 2020. And I will tell you more uh, about later on. And we also started to work on the reproducibility and the scalability of the device. In terms of uh, fabrication of identical sources in different chips, in order to be able to interfere photons from remote uh, sources. This is a very challenging task and never been uh, really uh, exploited or done because it's very hard to uh, already fabricate uh, identical devices with identical emission wavelengths. So there is a technological issue to face and there is also the need to have identical single photon temporal profile, which means that even the dynamics of each single emitter need to be 
engineer to be completely identical and have very high degree of indistinguishability. So we are not there yet, but we already started to uh, look into a way to do that, because if we imagine to fabricate on a large scale, high number of identical sources, then we could speed up even more the uh, quantum computing protocol above the uh, present performances. So what we have been done in this paper that you can find uh, here is a recent uh, publication. Uh, we took and we look uh, over 15 micropillar sources distributed of five different chips in terms of their way of functioning performances and uh, dynamics of the meter itself. So you can see here that we got very high reproducibility of very high and good performances, so very high brightness uh, above 10% in average and indistinguishability above 90% in average. And we also uh, look and saw that we can have um, very homogeneous emission wavelength among many devices in the same chip, but also among pillars in several chips. For example, this and these ones and, uh, and these ones. To note that these devices were not designed in order to be equal. They were uh, done one by one without paying much attention. So we can imagine uh, an automated process that can look at different uh, dots. We have millions in few centimeters square and then uh, choose the identical one and then fabricate identical device on top. Because as you can see also from this important figure where you can see the, uh, the decay time, so the dynamics of uh, most of the, of the sources, you, we can have very fine control of their emission dynamics in order to really carefully tune each one of them and uh, in theory have good indistinguishability from remote uh, single photon sources. So the last example uh, of the collaboration that we have been performing in uh, the past couple of years uh, consists in uh, the generation of entangled photon linear cluster state from our source. And this was done uh, in a collaboration with a group of Pascal, Quandela, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, especially the group of Agai Eisenberg uh, and his team. So the idea here is to uh, generate cluster state, which, as I said before, have a very high potential, both uh, especially in computing, but also in uh, communication. The idea is to take a single photon source, emit a single photon at different time being, and then use a loop, a sequential entangler, in order to take a photon, inserting in a loop, and do logic operation to entangle each photon entering the loop with the one that have been already entangled before. So here you really create a cluster state by keep feeding the, uh, the device with the photon emitted by the source. How does it look like? It's actually uh, very elegant in the sense that uh, there are always the, the sources that you've been seeing so far and the sequential entanglement, entangler is actually uh, included in this uh, box. So the circuit was designed by the team and uh, Professor Eisenberg and uh, the device fabricated by the Sterner company is a simple rack with a, a fiber input and two fiber output for the, um, for the analysis and some uh, connection to just plug in a computer and control all the electronics that you can see here. So for the story uh, a couple of years ago when we contact, were contacted by by the team uh, they shipped this box to Charles de Gaulle and it got stuck in the custom for two weeks but then when we managed to to get it the guys simply characterized it for a month or so and then flew back to Israel and we they were simply texting us asking to plug in single photons in the box and by remote access, they were creating and they were performing their experiments. So they were creating this cluster state by uh, doing their stuff on the laptop sitting 
uh, on the bus on the way to the university. So it was very fun. And finally, we have an archive here if you want to look at more uh, details. So the principle is that you carefully uh, select optical passes to excite the quantum dot source, and then you insert it in the box where you have all these elements. You have polarization controllers, a beam splitter, and uh, a loop, and the analysis uh, system. So in this part, actually here you can see the entire set of logic operation. So each photon goes into preparation step, it gets then into the uh, splitter in the loop where the polarization is prepared. And when it reaches the output of the loop, it counters the second photon coming in. And that's where the entanglement uh, is created. So the first photon leaves and the second stays in the loop and meeting the third uh, and so on. While on the final part here, we, uh, we look at the analysis. So we analyze the photons which are coming through and define the level and the visibility of the entanglement. So by the performances of the source, we were able to uh, fabricate and create three photon cluster state, a GAZ state, uh, in 11 minutes compared to the previous experiment done with this PDC, we took 34 hours. So we could uh, obtain 185 times speed up and therefore perform a four photon linear cluster state in one hour compared to the estimated time with the SPDC sources of uh, one year. Uh, excuse me, we have a question from Stanislav. Of course. Okay. And, and what is the single photon repetition rate here? So that's actually a good question. We were uh, using an EOM in order to selectively uh, select a train of pulses for the experiment with two photon, three photon, and four photon. In general, we had 80 megahertz uh, repetition rate limited by the electronics. And the, the sequence was used in order to match the, uh, the speed of the electronics for each of the experiment. So the limitation here on the visibility and on the number of photons we could generate was of course the brightness of the single photon source was around uh, 10, 12% and, uh, and the detectors. We had still APD detectors, 30% efficient, uh, just replacing a nanowire single photon detector we could maybe go up to five and six photon, keeping the same brightness. Now with new devices, maybe we will repeat uh, the measurement or hoping that someone else um, could perform it or come with another kind of uh, device. So the next uh, last part uh, I want to show you is toward the um, fabrication of a source which can be actually uh, not only PhD friendly, but actually user friendly. And the way that we, uh, the way it has to be done is by removing optical setup and free space component uh, and simply pigtail the uh, source, the micropillar source with a single mode fiber. Something that uh, has been done with laser technology and as the same principle as nanowire single photon detectors. The challenge here is that uh, compared to single photon detector, for example, where the precision is few, uh, few micron or tens of micron, what we require here is a precision of uh, 50 to 100 nanometer. So we need to align a single mode fiber to a two micron uh, waveguide and then make it stable at low temperature at four uh, Kelvin in the standard uh, cryostat, which actually uh, vibrates quite a lot. So we are in the process of this. We have already a, a design for the device that you can see here. So it's a rack tower where you will have all in one uh, cooling system, the cryogenic with the compressor that initially 
would be separated in another room and in the next version included inside this box, another box for the electronics and the optics, another for the laser, and here a computer to control all the different electronics. So it will be standalone. You will have simple fiber coming out of the system uh, where uh, the single photon then will be emitted at high rate. So this is all. Uh, thank you again and looking forward for the question. Thank you so much. So colleagues, please, questions. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Or, or can I go directly or uh, see that somebody? Please. Okay. So just uh, you showed uh, lots of uh, interesting advances in terms of uh, single photon sources. And uh, there's this motivation related to quantum computing and quantum simulation. And uh, we hear a lot about uh, the other platforms like uh, uh, superconducting systems and, um, and uh, uh, trapped ions. So could you, is it possible to give in a few words uh, a kind of landscape, uh, how you compare uh, perspectives of quantum comp computing or quantum simulation with photons and these other platforms? Okay. I, I can try, even though the, um, it's a very complex uh, comparison, uh, because each system has a lot of advantages and a lot of problems. Uh, the problems in the photonic uh, platform is that uh, gates are not deterministic. They are probabilistic. And this uh, increases the amount of resources needed in order to have a amount of qubit actually useful. And that's why the, uh, there is a lot of attention on the architecture and protocols, as I explained before, uh, especially from a couple of uh, startup, um, PsyQuantum, especially, which really looks into this multiplexing architecture in order to uh, overcome deterministic, uh, overcome the probabilistic uh, gates and still keep um, a possibility to develop a full-scale quantum computer. As the way they present it in optics, once you deal with this, so in fabricating a small cluster state, then the resources can be scaled up quite efficiently with integrated photonics. What is not uh, similar to other platforms where superconducting qubits or ion trial, where they can have very efficient two photon gates, for example, but they are uh, limited by some technological challenges, which comes from the fact that these devices need to be operated at room temperature or to uh, the possibility to uh, use multiple ions one after the other in a small uh, place. So it's a different kind of approach. One thing is clear though, is that these machines will be connected and the most efficient and maybe only platform that can do this efficiently is the optic one because it's already uh, based on photons. Thank you. Okay, may I ask? So it's, it's, I think it's, it's a typical question. So from optimistical but uh, realistic platform, could you estimate the, the, uh, the main parameters of your sources? Uh, in near the future, like distinguishability, coherence, uh, repetition rate, and so on. Um, yes, so, so far, maybe I went too fast, sorry for that. Uh, we can achieve uh, 
very good single photon purity and very good indistinguishability, which is required for uh, standard computation above 90% and an efficiency, so brightness around these values, which is enough for uh, 10 photon, for example, uh, considering the losses of integrated photonics, but cannot bring computation up to hundreds of photons, hundreds of qubits, which are the number uh, that in theory uh, should really permit to do something useful in terms of simulation of molecules or uh, optimization problems. So in order to go to hundreds of qubits, uh, we need to push the brightness higher at least to 50%, 50%, which together with the losses of the circuitry, it will allow to manipulate uh, efficiently in a good amount of time, reasonable time, hundreds of qubits. Is it a realistic scenario? I think it's realistic because what is limiting now this values is the way we uh, drive our system uh, that has been changed. There are new several uh, proposal, one that we will try to uh, make public in a paper in the next month, but there is already other two proposal with two devices which reach uh, almost 60% brightness in the fiber, which is already extremely high value and some best results uh, ever so far for a source of very highly indistinguishable photons. So far is one device from the group of uh, Mr. Warburton in uh, Basel. So it's possible by engineering the devices and uh, all these optics and uh, that's what we are working hard in order to improve thank you we have a question in the chat from pavel francis okay i can i can ask it directly um nicola i have a technical question so if i understand understood you correctly you use so-called self-assembled quantum dots as a source yes. Um, have you ever tried uh, colloid colloidal quantum dots? Uh, no, I never played with colloidal quantum dots. Uh, this is an interesting system. The problem in the system so far is the uh, indistinguishability, which comes from the coherence of the two-level system in globe in uh, represented by the Claudia quantum dots. In fact, phonons uh, represent phasing because each time you excite your quantum dot, you have additional processes which uh, kill your, um, reduce the, the coherence of your state. Uh, and that's still a big limitation for the colloidal quantum dots for single photon sources and it's a similar process problem for uh, uh, nitrogen vacancies in diamond, for example, or uh, silicon carbide vacancies and so on. So, and why the, your self-assembled quantum dots are, um, uh, they don't have this problem. I mean, they are, look very similar. So we have a quantum dot, which is a part of, of the same, of the same uh, molecular structure. So that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, the reason is that uh, when we cool down these devices, we reduce strongly the phonon population. And by using a cavity, which is basically a filter, we filter out the phonon uh, component and therefore manage to collect only the purely emitted photon, which do not undergo this dephasing problem. 
Well, absolutely, I, I agree with you, but I, it looks like that you can do the same procedure with colloidal quantum torsion. Uh, probably, yes, probably. Okay, uh, now there are examples of very good quantum dots. I mean, perovskite quantum dots. They are they practically don't blink. They have stable properties, and uh, you can you can just uh, prepare them with a given uh, wavelengths and so on and so on. So probably it is a good source for your future devices. Ah, I look forward to it. As I look forward for the organic molecules. Uh, base sources, which uh, had these problems a few years ago, but now when cooled to uh, 3 Kelvin and placed in photonic waveguide can behave really well. So, so I, probably, probably organic, organic molecules, they don't, 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 would not survive for long, you know, but quantum dots, they are very solid and very, very, very photostable. Yeah, so uh, I would I would rather I mean uh, put all the money on the on the solid on the solid state sources, not organic one. I think I'm I'm doing the same. <laughs> so we agree. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, one more question for the chat: uh, Could you specify the wavelength of your sources? Are they for telecom wavelength or not? So yes, I went fast also in this this specific quantum dots which are uh, indium gallium arsenide base, they emit in the wavelength range of 900 to 950 nanometers. Uh, we are looking forward to start working on devices towards telecom. And for this reason, uh, we have open position uh, and the process and the projects will start soon. Although we know it's very hard uh, the community have tried extensively in the past 10 years and something, some good results are, are coming out, not yet with highly indistinguishable photon. And we uh, would like now to merge what we have learned so far with these new materials because they require different materials, so different process, and uh, try to re-adapt the concept to these wavelengths, which we know has a lot of potential. Okay. Can uh, I ask you, a question? Uh, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, for generation of entang entangled photon cluster states, are you using nonlinear media having second order or third order nonlinearity? Non uh, no. So a part of the results I presented before with external uh, entangle, entangler uh, using the source, what we are trying to do, and the project just started with a PhD student, partially co-founded by Quandela, but carry on in the group, is to use uh, charge excitons, so called trion state, uh, which are a uh, four level system which gathers a spin. And the idea is to control the spin and entangle the emitted photons with the spin of the quantum dot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when the protocol is done properly, then you will have a chain of photons emitted, all entangled to each other and all entangled with the spin, which will be the the reading qubit. Mm -hmm. But in your slide, I think I have seen the loop, and that loop uh, is used to uh, produce entangled photons. Maybe uh, so. Yes. I thought that this is something should be nonlinear media. Uh, no, sorry if, that didn't, if I wasn't okay. clear enough. So here we play with polarization of the incoming. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This state, this polarization controller, mm -hmm. is simply electronic, which twists a fiber, mm -hmm. pairs the uh, incoming polarization diagonal, so position horizontal and vertical polarization, 
So there is a probability that the photon goes in. And here the polarization is controlled in order to be entangled with the coming photons, which is again in uh, diagonal polarization. Mm -hmm. This process is based on this set of operator. Uh, and I really invite you to take a look at the, mm -hmm. at the paper to get the exact sequence of the operation, but there is no, no linear medium. It's just linear, uh, linear optics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's polarization based entanglement. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, when you, so when you specify SPDC, uh, it does not correspond to nonlinear media. Yes. So sorry, sorry again. So okay. Uh, the same. Uh, sequential entangler was used taking single photons from an SPDC mm. in a previous experiment. So they had the nonlinear medium to generate the single photons, but the entangling process and the protocol was the same. Mm -hmm. Just the single photon were created not by quantum dots, but by uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion. So here you have comparison uh, between nonlinear media and linear media. So in your in your case, you are getting uh, eleven minutes uh, for three photons, right? And and, and uh, in case of nonlinear media, they, they were getting uh, photons in thirty four hours, right? Yes, exactly. Because with the mm -hmm. T process, mm -hmm. the generation is probabilistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the emission efficiency, so the brightness is limited compared to what we can do with these deterministic sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, one more question. Are you using any couplers like linear and nonlinear uh, couplers? Or in, in your case, uh, maybe you are using some other couplers. Is there any couplers here which you are using? In, in quantum optics, we usually use uh, couplers, linear and nonlinear media, to interact. So here, is there any couplers? Um, cup, no. If I understand correctly, I mean the only couplers we have are the these objects we use to uh, optimize and mode match the uh, photon, the optical mode of the photons with the optical mode of the fiber. That's mm -hmm the coupler we use, but they are simple set of lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about then uh, the noises? Uh, so do we have uh, controllable noises in this case? If uh, in, in nonlinear optics, uh, we can somehow, we can control the noises. And in, in your case, uh, what about the noises? Do you have some control mechanism? Uh, the level of noise, I mean. Mm. The noise, I mean, uh, the noise intrinsic of the single photon emitter is what is limiting the indistinguishability. So we can control it at some point uh, up to the maximum optimization where noise is reduced and indistinguishability is a maximum 95% or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so oh, I okay, think... uh, excuse me, we have several more questions uh, from sure, chat, sure. so Ranjit, if you... Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Okay, so uh, several questions from uh, Ilya Rodionov. Uh, what is the wall roughness of your micropillars after itching? How critical is it? And how do you usually select good dots after deposition from million dots? Automatic selection procedure, could you please again explain the construction of the source? Unfortunately, I miss it during presentation. So can you repeat the, the uh, you, you you may see in chat. Uh, so maybe Ilya can ask himself. Uh, I think he's have, here. If you have microphone. <laughs> yes, of course. Ah, hello. Hi, Nicola. Thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Um, my question was about the microstructure of the source. Uh, do you have uh, some information about the roughness of the walls? of your micro pillars after each year. Is it critical or not? 
It's yes, indeed, is uh, crucial. So I, if you, if we have some minutes, I can go more in detail uh, into the fabrication system, how we do select these quantum dots. So at first, by molecular beam epitaxy, we obtain a planar structure. You can see the large wafer with bottom mirror, top mirror, and all the dots hidden in the cavity region, which are invisible. Okay, then we spin coat a photosensitive material and we place the entire chip in a cryostat on nano positioner. And then, uh, and then with the confocal system, we excite the device and at the same time we move the sample. Okay. And we collect what is emitted by the dot when we come to excite the dot and we can recollect and uh, construct a map of the emission of the dots by scanning an area by 30, 30 micro, for example. So you, we move the sample, so we excite back and forth uh, the area. And when we overlap with dot, we can find one and have the, um, spectral position. Then we place on it, we turn on the exposure laser, which marks the position of the dot because it's a photosensitive material. And we change the power matching the energy of the dot. By larger power, we expose a larger area, lower power, lower area is what defines the final size of the micropillar and therefore the energy of the optical mode, which then will match the energy of the dot, which is in it. Then going back into the clear room, we etch the rest of the material and we do it very carefully with the, is a recipe that was created 15 years ago for different kinds of structure. We re-optimize it for our one uh carefully adjusting the size and then we end up with this beautiful randomly placed pillars but which all contain a quantum dot uh -huh. and what is the order of ragnas do you know this uh i think i don't know uh -huh. I was lucky enough to arrive at the point where someone else did the dirty job and it was optimized and I could just do it and it was working. I see. And this selection of the dots, it's uh, something like just a level cutting. So, um, I mean, you just use the dots with some level of intensity. Yes, it's both intensity and the clean uh, emission. Mm -hmm. I can select a dot which may be near other ones, so I have spurious emission from nearby dots. So I want one which is isolated, and the lines are clear, stable, and bright. And you can imagine this fully automated with a machine the scans, looks at the specific set range in the spectrometer and go look for other dots which sit on the same range and simply shining where the dots are. And therefore at the end, okay, thank you. end up with the very similar devices. Thank you. And can you stop a little bit on this X type microstructure of the source which you showed us? Could you explain a little bit of what is the idea of this? Yes. So uh, the point of the uh, the micro pillar with the ridges is that we wanted to control uh, and apply an electric field, which could be seen by the quantum dot. Mm -hmm. So we need to uh, find a way, clever, to contact this micro pillar to a larger area where we can deposit metal we can stick a wire and apply voltage through it. Okay. 
So okay. we have tried to place very carefully tiny uh, gold ring around the micropillar, which is very dangerous because you can damage the micropillar. Uh, you have to put a lot of care. So the way we have decided to do simply by enlarging the structure so you can overlap a part of the source, which is not the source itself, to a larger area. You can see here, okay, this dial, where you can place your electrical contact and do it even many times without risking of dam damaging the micropillar itself. Okay, thank you. Hope it's more clear. Okay, uh, so we have several more questions from uh, our chat. Uh, so just maybe moment. maybe we can ask the, the author of the question to just spell it out. <laughs> okay. Okay, no. we have just, just there are small questions uh, from uh, Renier Rayo. Uh, what do you mean uh, by the the way we drive the system? Okay. Uh, so these devices are optically excited. Okay. So we send the laser, and we uh, we take the single photon back. Okay. So in this scheme, you see what we call exciton or trion what is really representing our two-level system. In case of an exciton, is a three-level system. In case of a trion, is a four-level system. Now, what we do in order to achieve uh, high indistinguishability to coherently drive the system is to excite resonantly, which means that we set the wavelength of the laser in resonance to this transition, okay? So it means that the single photon emitted have the same energy as the laser. So I have to find a way to only select my single photon and get rid of the laser, which has the same energy. And this way, the only way we can do now is by polarization selection. So we excite with laser linearly polarized vertically. And for the internal process, some of the emitted photons comes out with horizontal polarization. So with the beam splitter and a polarizer, we can then select only the horizontally polarized photons and rejecting all the laser. This process though is more efficient if you collect all the photons. Here we are getting rid of them of most of twice of this single photon because of this polarization selection. And that's what is limiting at the moment the brightness, not because we don't have single photon emitted, but because the way we drive the system, we are obliged to throw away more than a half. Uh, yes. Uh, so how can you get rid of it? <laughs> yeah. So the proposal that are now uh, in fashion is to fabricate very elliptical micropillars. So the two modes, the horizontal and the vertical mode, they are so split in energy that you can get rid of your laser with a very narrow filter. Mm -hmm because the two modes, the horizontal and vertical, are split by some hundred of picometer, my laser then is a bit farther away than my single photons. So I don't need anymore the trick of the uh, polarization rejection to collect the highest amount of single photon. What is the bandwidth, bandwidth of the filter? Uh, Depending on the design, I think uh, uh, in 
the group of Chai Wan Lue, Zhang Wei Pan, they were using uh, maybe 50 nanometer, uh, sorry, uh, 500 picometer or so. Something like that. Some other people use a, a much complex system with uh, uh, gratings to disperse and then recompress laser and single photon. But clearly it's demanding in terms of fabrication because you need really to refabricate a complete set of devices in order to achieve this. You cannot use what you have. And in our proposition, we have a different pumping scheme, which works with any device you have in your lab. So you don't need to refabricate one. So if you have a device which is uh, working under resonance fluorescence with a certain brightness, with the system that we will propose, you can make it work in a different way, obtain the same purity, single photon purity, and almost double the brightness. I have a related question. So in a scheme with this trion excitation, your photons should be polarization entangled, right? Uh, so they should have same frequency. And how do you get rid of the pump there? Um, so to be clear here in the bottom image, you see the dynamics of the emission of the exciton and the trion under resonance fluorescence, okay? The bumps here are very beautiful sign of this oscillation of polarization of the state internally. When we drive coherently our system, we can take back some single photon emitted in the, uh, orthogonal polarization because of this fine structure splitting, which makes turn the polarization back and forth. And that's what you see here. By using a trion, this doesn't happen because by linearly exciting uh, the trion, since it's uh, circularly polarized um, affected, here you have the same probability of exciting both. So you have immediate emission of the orthogonal polarization photon, even if you excite either one or the other. So that's why you have a single exponential decay. Yes, but you, 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 if you are using a polarizing beam splitter uh, to, to, to couple the pump inside and to filter it out then, how do you get both polarizations of the entangled photons out? I, I, I don't get it. Uh, we're not, ah. So, well, the system is gonna get complicated because we will require a magnetic field and an external additional laser in order to select uh, the spin, reinitialize the spin of the system each uh, before each uh, single photon emission. If you refer at the protocol to uh, generate entangled photons from a trion. Okay, uh, we have several questions also from chat. Uh, just one small question from uh, Maxim Raklin. Uh, how many times do you need to quench laser radiation during resonant excitation to get low G2? Uh, now we work with an extinction ratio of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. But uh, that it was hard in the beginning. Now is uh, with some experimental tricks is quite efficient and easy considering that in under resonant excitation to drive the system, we only need few nanowatt power. We actually quantified the number of photons that we require in order to uh, initialize the, the state, so reach a pi uh, pulse, and that's roughly 10 photons per pulse. 
because we really have a very clean system, very high input coupling. So we don't need a lot of power, so it's easy to, uh, to reject. Uh, okay, thank you. And uh, the last question in chat, as I see, uh, in your opinion, what are the main challenges in achieving meaningful indistinguishability, say greater than 95% from different sources? Is it even possible with this type of dots and structures? Ah, it's not impossible. So <laughs> the first demonstration in 2016 uh, with these bright devices, uh, we managed to achieve 99.5%. This was with an additional filtering, so post-selection of the single photons. The filtering can be efficient up to 70% when properly designed. Uh, the way it works is because we you can get rid of the latest amount of the phonon dispersion in the tail of the single photon. And therefore you really post-select uh, the, the most indistinguishable part. So it, it, it can be possible and it, I mean, it will be done by this additional filtering. Oh. Okay, thank you. So if there are all the questions, yeah, I think it's actually the time to finish. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you again for the good uh, talk. Uh, it was very interesting as we see how many questions it was. So thank you and see you again in our seminar. <laughs> Thanks to you and looking forward to chat further if someone interested. Okay. Well, thank you. And oh, thanks all very good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> see you thank next you. week. Thank, thank you for you. listening. Bye. Yeah. See you next week. See you.